All right, what's up everyone? Um, I'm gonna do a recap of EACC9. Uh, event was good. We had 63 players play. The champion section was won by Eric Wang, Ethan Sheehan, Andrew Zhang, Vishrith Yelisetti, and Damon Krotov. So it was a five-way tie for first with three out of four. Um, basically, no one really went off. Um, There's a bunch of draws. I would say it wasn't like uh, it wasn't very much like a uh, boring draws. It was these guys actually played. Everyone played well, and uh, it just couldn't break through. So that's gonna happen. Under eighteen hundred was won by William Remick and Adrian King. These guys both went three and a half out of four. Uh, this one was more of a last round. They were both three out of three. No one could really catch them, so they're like, all right, I guess we will take the draw. Uh, both of them played pretty well. Adrian, I would say, kind of got lucky round three. I saw one of, uh, he played one of my students, but both of them played well, cruised, um, and they both cashed. Under 1400 was a three-way tie for Christian by Christian Ward, Benjamin Chia, XIA, and Lucas Kiros. Um, <laughs> this is the first time we've really had this many ties, I'd say. This is a three-way tie for first with three and a half out of four. Um, I think once again, all of them played pretty well. I think they all won their last round. So it's not like they were all taking draws the last round. Actually, there was one person with three out of three, uh, this guy, Greg Cook, and he ended up actually losing to, to Benjamin, uh, the last round. And that is why there's no four out of four. So this one was more very competitive where they all battled in the last round to get there. And then the senior prize, the new senior prize that we added, uh, basically anyone over 50 plus was won by William Remick with three out of four. Um, yeah, interesting that basically if you do really well, you're gonna get this bonus. I, for, at least for now, we're planning on keeping this senior prize. But, and honestly, I do wanna start thinking about adding more prizes especially creative prizes. Um, but at least for the next tournament, we're gonna keep the senior prize and we're gonna keep moving from here. Uh, so notable performances. So this is a little bit new. We did do performance bonuses, but I also now wanna shout out everyone that pretty much did pretty well or gained uh, 100 plus points. So there was a bunch of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. So basically 10 students, not 10 students, 10 people all gained a, about 100 points. I mean, some people even more than 100 points. Uh, at least something cool for me was five of them were actually my students. Um, so I think I had about seven, eight or nine students play and five of them gained 100 plus. So that's always a, a nice little feeling as a, as a, as a coach. Um, I probably should get into this later, but let me just, I'm just gonna add this here because it makes sense. Um, a couple of my students, I think lost crucial games um, either in the last either in the last round or round three and honestly it was just a one or two but I think as a teacher um, especially going to the last round um, or playing someone in an important game I should have kind of stepped in and given them just a little speech just like all right this is what you want to focus on this is what you got to do it's like almost like corner advice um, and pretty much um, what I would have told them because I think both of them just honestly just did needed not to lose um, and they ended up taking some risk in the last round and succumbing to the to this risk. So looking back in retrospect, I definitely uh, want to give them a little like, all right, this is like what you want to do. Basically between rounds, like, all right, focus on this, focus on this. Remember, you're already doing well. Just don't let them get counterplay. Watch out for tactics. If you draw, you still win. Like that. that's basically what I would have told these guys. So that's something that I'm definitely going to do more. Um, before rounds and knowing the opponent, I'm just trying to go through real quick, hit the big points. But I mean, overall, um, students did pretty well. Performance bonuses were won by Saha Swarup, Vibhu Mangapuri, <laughs> Raphael Funk, and Alex Coleman. Um, Alex, this is his first tournament in a while. He's actually a student of Ethan Sheehan's. Um, he was 294 and he beat someone who was 1100 first round I think he beat someone who was 900 and then he also drew someone he drew the guy who actually won the tournament so he really really overperformed um as did everyone else Raphael Funk actually 
he gained about actually 200 points and he beat the top two people in a section um, so that 100% is very impressive um, and then Vibu got crossed a thousand so he got his blue belt and Sahas gained 200 points he also beat someone about 600 points higher rated than him so definitely a performance bonus worthy um, just one thing to remember if you won a prize you probably don't get a performance bonus because um, you already won a prize so there definitely were a couple other people that could have got bonuses but um, they already won a bunch of money so no need to give them free entry into the next tournament so everyone with a performance bonus gets free entry into one future tournament our next tournament is planned for June 1st um, it's booked it's scheduled and then we are definitely planning a two-day pretty big tournament over the summer I'm not planning on at least traveling a big chunk of the summer I'm gonna travel in pockets here and there but not do the whole I'm gone for a month and a half kind of thing um, honestly it just it's a bit taxing traveling a lot a lot um, it's it's really the in-between and the, the moving and not speaking the language and uh, summer I just want to relax I actually turned 30 this summer that's gonna be something interesting um, and I 100% I do plan on playing tournaments and really trying to push for GM um, summer is the time to do it so that's the plan over the summer uh, okay so now pros and cons so pros once again very smooth event nothing really crazy happened um, the numbers were great were good 63 people our last we did have 71 so we did want to try to break 70 or get to 80 this tournament um, but it is what it is I mean there's definitely a lot of people in Georgia that I know um, could have played or were out of town that would have played so I mean that's just gonna be something that happens um, I mean one good thing another good thing is maybe it's because we planned ahead so much and we we put this the tournaments out but uh, there wasn't a conflicting tournament the same day and uh, we definitely got a lot of new faces that's I think always a good thing um, when you can see you're getting new customers um, but I think something that goes hand in hand with that is customer retention for sure we definitely want to retain um, a lot of the new guys or old guys um, and if we keep basically building on this building the list like I mean it wouldn't be a shocker to hit 100 people in one tournament um, of course I think that day is, it's not exactly going to be the next one but uh, at some point 100% we plan on getting 100 people and that would be that'll be a, a very great day um, some other pros uh, we ended up using uh, instead of one room for the main tournament we broke it into two rooms I think this was definitely uh, something that was good um, it made Skittles more focused into the one of the other rooms um, I think it definitely fixed the talking problem where the Skittles rooms was right next to the main room and now that it's turned into a playing room um, people basically have to go outside the tournament hall or go to the the back room where we have the printers and do the pairings to actually talk or do anything um, so for the most part I 100% think that was a good choice and it did take care of the problem of people talking during the games I mean still a little thing little things like here and there but 100% progress um, overall uh, trophies we did bring back trophies one I have trophies to give um, now one of the problems that I, I kind of think about is some of the trophies to big to give are very very big and <laughs> basically if we use these really big trophies people are going to expect really big trophies for future events and not we can't really regress back to down <laughs> or smaller trophies so we we got we got to use some of the smaller ones but um at some point i don't know what to do with the big ones of course we planning on having a big tournament so we can 100 percent use the big trophies for that but um yeah i guess we just save them for the right ones and and make sure not to promise like these huge trophies for every tournament because uh that's gonna be a, a hard bargain to sell um so yeah trophies are back um another cool thing with the back room is that what became a pretty cool hangout spot we got some pool back there um not like a swimming pool the game pool and there was, was something i was wondering like can people hear us are we pretty audible with with the door closed but I did ask one of the players in the tournament and they said they couldn't really hear anything so that room is a hundred percent good I guess it's soundproofed good enough so uh, uh, I mean that's definitely a keeper that's gonna be a, 
the setup, the new setup, 100% is something that we are pretty happy with and we will keep. Um, now let me go into some improvement. So, um, so timing. Um, so here's the story why the first round started maybe five, maybe 10 minutes late. Um, and it really starts with a butterfly effect. So um, we got score sheets, we set up the day before, but I need to get pens and I could have gotten them earlier and I know where the two boxes of pens are. They're in one of the schools I teach. Um, but I was all right, I'll just buy pens. Like I don't need to go get them again. Um, but pretty much what happened is I never got the pens. So I had to get them Saturday morning and Office Depot only opens at 9 a.m. So I was basically there at the tournament at like 8.40 maybe, maybe 8.45. But I basically had to wait off Office Depot, um, took a couple minutes, got there at 9.10, 9.15. Once again, we're still, um, we're still ready to go, um, but we're kind of just taking our time, kind of doing things. Um, and then kind of one thing leads to another. We, I mean, we got like two signups here and there, but we, basically there was no sense of urgency. And then we had like board numbers last minute kind of come up, just some little things come up. And uh, that kind of led to the tournament starting a couple minutes late. Um, so really, I think the fix there is until everything is 100% ready, set up, there's tape, there's um, standings, there's all this kind of stuff. Like there needs to be a sense of urgency. And I'm, this is basically like very similar to chess where once you have like a winning position, once you know your position is good, you kind of like take your foot off the gas and you're like, all right, I can do kind of this, whatever. Like we got time, we're doing well. And then all of a sudden, next thing you know, like you're down on time or like <laughs> your opponents come back and now you're like, oh my God, I was winning. Like, how am I losing now? So like, of course, like the event ran very smooth. Like everything was good, but the reason the the round started a little bit late was because of these little things that kind of added up. And, and honestly, the biggest thing is just no sense of urgency um, when we had, quote unquote, a good position. So that's definitely something that we want to definitely uh, harp on to make sure every round starts late. Now, once again, the best, that, uh, honestly, a really good idea, though it does have some setbacks, is we have this lunch break from two to four. Um, and what's great about that is if we start maybe 10 minutes late and then 10 minutes late the next game, we're going to be back on track for round three to finish back on time. So um, it, we do have a system in place to um, not have to worry too much, but something to improve. Um, bathroom is definitely something that needs improvement. There actually was a little kerfuffle, I would say, <laughs> about the bathroom. Um, yeah, I definitely understand. It's kind of stressful only having one bathroom. And at some point, one of the bathrooms closed. And kind of the story here was at some point, both of the bathrooms closed. And then the guy was like, okay, both the bathrooms are closed. I got to do something. And then he basically fixed one of the bathrooms. Um, and then one of the guys was like, oh, you can fix the bathrooms. What's like, why didn't you do that before? Blah, 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 blah. These guys. And <laughs> basically it was having dirt while we were at lunch. But 100% we want to fix the bathroom. And, and uh, I mean, the, probably the solution is we we're at the point where, I mean, this venue is great. The venue is really good, but we do want to start looking to maybe more, I would say professional, more accommodating venues. Um, and already we are doing that. It's just not easy. Um, for me, I'm really kind of booked up uh, busy wise till the 27th. But after that, basically starting May, I'm really going to be on the hunt for, uh, can we do this or what is, what is, what else is available here? And how do we grow this? Um, at least venue wise so um, that was definitely a problem um, now sponsors um, I definitely think we we, we want to improve and it's not like getting sponsors like people who are support chess or people who just want to you know help support the tournament it's really sponsors where it's a business and we are a business and it would make sense for both of us to help each other like during lunch we have about 60 people who are looking for food any business wants I mean, 60 people is a good amount of people. That's that's a good amount of revenue for a food or for a food, a restaurant. So 100%, I believe, like, there should be some restaurant we can partner with to feed people and also get some kind of commission or some kind of reward um, because we have this, this big base of people looking for food. Um, on top of that, business-wise, yeah, it is kind of interesting, like... Uh, what else would really benefit 
from chess tournament or a group of 60 people. I would say local businesses, um, but it is hard to promise anything if we don't know if it's going to work. Like, I think for food, we can guarantee, okay, if we have a partnership, like, at least 30 people would be interested in getting food. Like, when we go to lunch, we have a group of, I guess, like, seven, eight people who are looking to get food. So, um, food, I can guarantee, but let's say, like, what one time we had a, a pet store um, sponsor us, and, uh, I mean, I know at least one person who, who had heard of them and got their supplies there and was like, oh, my God, I know this place. But as far as more than that, like, I can't really guarantee anything. Um, so food for sure we can work on anything else, then we got to be creative and, and really try to figure out how do we benefit the business and, um, get them value for, for sponsoring. And then, yeah, so venues we're working on. So that's kind of it for improvement. So that's pretty much the recap of the tournament, the, the notable performances, um, I guess to, to close this session, this, this part of the podcast, I'll go ahead and just list all the notable performances. So Eric Wang went from 2004, 2048, he drew a 23, basically 2400 and he drew a 2150. So two people about 500 points higher than him. Um, and this is the difference between winning and drawing everyone else on this list, basically instead of drawing, um, two people or three people they won three games and he gained 40 points which is good especially above 2000 but if those draws are wins you gain 100 points so the next example was also in the open section this kid Vishrit Yelisetti um, and basically he beat three people 200 points higher than him and he gained 100 points went from 1762 to 1872 um, I talked about Sahas who got the performance bonus he went from 1114 to um, four, basically 1300 um, one rule that we added that I think made a lot of sense and worked well was um, if you win this section, you're allowed to play up in the next section, even if your rating is a little bit um, not quite there. And something that we did have to talk about is can you play up every single time or can you only play up once? So um, basically, we decided that it would make sense to you can only play up once. And um, uh, that was the husk, but pretty much now he can he can play up because his ratings up higher enough. Um, another person, Miles Wang, he went from thirteen ninety one to fourteen eighty six. Um, so not quite a hundred points, but still a solid performance. Uh, Lucas Kuros went from ten eighteen to ten eighty two. Um, what kind of hurt was he drew Ethan Student, who isn't really two hundred strength. He's much stronger, um, but he basically almost gained a hundred points. Let's talk about Vibu. Um, he went from nine thirteen to ten twenty five, getting his blue belt. He beat two people, 200 points plus. Um, Greg Cook, um, he went from 794 to 986. Basically getting his blue belt, he's uh, about 14 points away. And if he had drawn the last game or he had won the last game, he 100% would have been above. So, I mean, he basically was started at 200 uh, uh, a year ago, and he's come all the way up to basically nine or basically 1,000. So a lot of good progress for him. Um, Ra uh, Raphael Funk. 843 to 1031 beat the top two people in the section 1300 and 1200 so he basically gained about 200 points alex coleman uh, i talked about performance bonus 294 to 595 gained 300 points honestly he had the like the biggest upset he beat someone a thousand points higher rated than him and then beat someone i think 600 points higher rated than him so i mean that's pretty insane and then phoenix harris went from zero to 686 played his first tournament ended up beating one of his friends he actually had a winning position against someone um, 1100 and if he had won that game he would have just gained so much rating he would have gained like been a, a thousand or 1100 for starting rating which would have been insane so that's pretty much from the tournament now I'm gonna talk about chess training chess students in life definitely got a lot of things going on here um, so that'll be what we we'll talk about next all right so now I'm gonna talk about my chess training and the first thing that I got to talk about that a hundred percent has made a huge huge difference is basically I play blitz like here and there just a couple games a day and it was like five games in a row that I had a winning position and I flagged to some some just some stupid like two queens versus a pawn or like I'm up a rook and he does some like 
he moves his rook so it's hanging and then takes my rook in time pressure and i was like all right this is silly and i, I basically i got to like the lowest rating i've been in a long time like 24 50. um so i was like all right it's time to play with increment so i started playing three plus two and literally out of 20 games i i, I lost one game like it's such a different kind of vibe like you're actually playing chess you're not just playing push the wood or move the pieces and try to flag them when you're dead lost like basically in three plus two like if the game is over the game is over like if you're losing you can still come back but it's not like you're down a queen and you have winning chances so that has been a huge huge improvement i don't know why i put it off for so long like i had already been harping to my students like always play with increment it's better for some reason i guess i thought i was above it and i was like no i've been playing three minute for so long like this is what i do but i switched to three plus two huge huge change games have gotten way better i mean instantly gained like 70 points and just playing well and i want to see like happy to play like when i when i dropped 24 50 I, when i lost like eight games in a row i was like am i just bad like what is going on here i'm like practicing i mean i will say it was like during the tournament before the tournament so there's other things on my mind um so um it was i guess a little bit different to say to but yeah 100 percent better three plus two huge fan um now another thing that i've been doing with my sensei is we've been going through this Ramesh calculation book and um it's uh it's made lead chess a lot easier like the puzzles that we be doing are like they're so some of them are so hard and some of them like you don't even you're not even winning it's like you're just making good moves and it's hard to see it's hard to do um but now that i do puzzle on lead chess like i've definitely seen an improvement and like it's it's more like you don't even have to spend that much time you kind of just know the flow of what you're trying to do if that makes sense like uh, you know what to watch out for you know what's good you know kind of if it's a puzzle or it's like this kind of position i gotta watch out for this like uh one big idea that i'll say is like a lot of times you got to maximize the position so like you have a move and then you got to find all right what is the the best move order for me to play this if you find that then boom that's a lot of times just the right answer so um just doing these calculations just uh i mean honestly uh, some, so this has happened once or twice where it's like i just know like i have enough play here or i just have like this position with based off my pieces is good for for my side if that makes sense so it's not like i mean of course like at some point you have to just sit and go through all the moves and make sure like this all checks out and works but also at the same time, like you kind of know, hey, if my pieces are like this and I have enough by his king, like this is gonna work. And I, I literally had a puzzle like that today, so that that, that was uh, it's good. It's really cool to see. Um, now another thing that I kind of talked about that we're done with openings. Like of course we're still working on openings, but this is actually how we're learning openings and how we're getting better. And we started doing this today, and it felt like a hundred percent felt like progress. So we're actually going line by line and like reviewing and playing the lines that we went over in three plus two and then we'd analyze the games and kind of i guess probably what i gotta do tomorrow is write down what i learned um add it to the file that way it, it sinks in um but actually playing the positions having games in it um kind of what we do is we play every line twice so the first one for the most part i get it wrong like i'm like am i supposed to do this and he was like no we talked about this and then the second game i got way closer and then they changed it a little bit um, but basically just having the muscle memory of, all right, this is where the pieces go. Last time I did this and it was wrong. Now this time I do this, like, uh, that a hundred percent feels just like more comfortable with the way I'm moving and stuff. Um, so sparring is really great. Um, we have a tournament I have, or we, I guess both of us have a tournament coming up this weekend. So we're going to basically go through the field and, uh, kind of expect the openings that are coming and then, um, play those lines. A couple games here analyze a couple games here analyze so now that it's been like a lot of it was just studying and going through and clicking through and reading and now it's really starting to get into my wheelhouse which is just playing and i think this is going to be really good for him because he's very knowledgeable he has very like amazing knowledge um but it's the execution where i think um he probably wants to improve a bit not that i have great execution i definitely need to improve that too but i think this is going to be really good for him and the fact that we're not making an ego thing trying to be systematic about it and like we're doing this with a purpose not to beat each other but to go through enough things 
so that we're going to feel ready on Saturday. Um, so really excited to do that. And uh, now that my schedule is starting to free up, so I will say like I will definitely be in good form for this weekend. But after not, so in two weeks, my schedule is very, very free. And now I will be really, really grinding this. Like we will be playing everything and get going through everything. So by May, May by June, like uh, I mean, I would definitely expect to see peak final form incoming with the way that we're practicing and studying. Um, so really happy that we're sparring. Um, one thing that I've definitely learned, and I think this is really important for older chess players or people who are not kids, is you really need to review the stuff you learn. And the reason why is I think as you get older, it's not about can you remember as much or are you as good as remembering? It's you have more things you have to remember. You have bills, you have kids, you have work, you have your wife, you have or your girlfriend, you have this, this, and then you have your friends, and then what you're doing on the weekend, and then what you have coming up. And I think the problem is your bandwidth just starts running low to the point where you don't get to review and go through the material. So I think if you're an older chess player, take time and review what you learned. I think this is really, really important because um, once you review, now it really starts to stick or sink in. And then I think what's really important, at least for me, is actually playing it and going through it. And that's when uh, I think you, you hit that phase where it's, uh, all right, now I actually know this. Now we can actually work it and uh, uh, I feel like I'm better now. So uh, definitely if you're older, I think the, the, the advantage that kids have is that they just don't have as much going on so they can be more free about only focusing on one thing or not having to worry about all these other things. Whereas adults, um, we don't really have that luxury as much. Um, and then the last thing um, that i kind of been doing is uh, waking up early. So the reason why this is so important is one, means I have a more productive day. It means I'm more on top of my life. Two, it means I get to have more time with my sensei because he's only free up until 2.33. Um, and after that, he's busy with kids, wife, and all this kind of stuff. So if I want to maximize my time, I have to wake up early. Um, and knowing that, okay, this is my goal, this is what I want to do, like basically I'm forced into waking up early. And uh, what's really great is for me, it's always hard to wake up early, but then it's always hard for me to fall asleep. Like once I'm up, I'm not really going to get tired. So it's not even like I wake up at seven or eight and I go to bed at 10 p.m. If I wake up at six or seven or eight, I'm still awake till one, 12. Like right now I'm recording this, it's 12 o'clock, 12 a.m. And I still have a couple more sections to go and I'm still gonna watch this, uh, this Warriors game and then I'm still gonna uh, go hit the, the bag downstairs too. So a couple things that I'm definitely gotta do. So I'm, I'm still, I'm mean, wide awake, a lot of energy. Um, so waking up early, like if once like I really get this down, I think this is gonna be another very integral part to, to, to trying to make GM and all this kind of good stuff. So that's been chess training for me. The big things are three plus two, sparring, calculating, and realizing the, what you need to do as you're an older chess player. So next I will talk about my students and then lastly I'll talk about life. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about my chess students. So um, but they did pretty good in the tournament. Um, openings are really good. I think I've already talked about this like a million times. But basically quizzes, tests, and just basically knowing everything that they're gonna go over. Um, um, their openings are good. Now one thing I do wanna do is organize it a bit better. Like different people have different things on their on their spreadsheets, as in like, just in a different kind of way. So I definitely need to find a way to organize this um, and uh, make this better. Um, and where this becomes very tough is group classes. Like when it's one on one, I can just go you know boom 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 go through the lines what you need to know. But in group classes, it moves a lot slower, which is very annoying. Um, so, yeah. I mean yeah, annoying just in terms of. I just feel like we should be covering more faster. And I guess this is how teachers feel when it comes to classes. But to be fair, in classes you give homework and you have grades. And I guess that's what I gotta do. Give them homework and be like, all right, you gotta do this, this, this next week. If you don't, and then give them a test, boom. And uh, if you fail, you fail. Like, then, yeah, I know, then people get depressed and sad. Then I become a therapist and a psychologist. That is, <laughs> like, when, when things are good, it's, uh, it's very easy to teach. Um, but when things are going tough or, or bad, 
like you low-key have to become like a psychologist or a therapist for your student too and be like well what's going wrong like how's life and all this kind of stuff um and that's when it becomes like hard like i mean i'm trained to do chess i haven't really done much training in psychology and all this kind of stuff and that's where i think it's really like you need to demand a level amount of work and professionalism if you're paying for lessons you got to do this if you're doing bad on the test well you got to figure it out if you keep failing like what am i supposed to do i taught you this i went over with you i gave you the answers but you're still getting it wrong <laughs> i don't know that's where it's like all right i don't know where to go where to go from here like i've done what i can do and uh i mean so far no one's been like that tough but um it's definitely something that i've had uh to do with as being a chess coach and uh i mean basically my solution now is there's a level of practice and training that you need to complete and if you do i mean what i've seen people who do the training the people who complete what they're supposed to do this is never really an issue for them it's always the people who are slacking off or who are taking days off or who won't, oh, who aren't doing their training now once again this is a very small percentage the, the vast percentage is doing well but this is definitely something um i uh definitely think about now now with openings done middle games um have become really the new focus middle games and end games so the way i improve middle games is drills are really important basically breaking down categories like defense in between moves two choices lines of fire um that's a very big category um that i basically that'll try to give a student three minutes get as many as possible and then switch categories keep track of your numbers try to keep moving up um that way you can see um that you're progressing um, another big thing is CCT, it's the idea of checks, captures, and threats. Basically, you go piece by piece, list out every checks, capture, and threat that it can do. That way, uh, it really improves your board vision and just seeing everything. Um, another one is winning, winning positions. So this is, certain players have their strengths, certain players have their weaknesses, and for some players, it is winning, winning positions. Like, that's where they kind of struggle the most. Um, and kind of what I do for that, I have two things. First thing that I do is I uh, I let them play me, but I'm down a queen, and this pretty much happens every time. I mean, okay, if you're basically if you're 800 plus, you don't play me down a queen, but for anyone below 1800, down a queen, like I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty much winning a very high percentage of these games, because this is what happens: the first game, they they try to checkmate me. They come out strong. They're just like, all right, I'm gonna throw my pieces, and when it gets into a firefight, like they give me chances, and that's how I come back. So when you're up a queen, basically I tell them is you need to focus on control, especially against a stronger player or a high rated player. If you give them chances, they will find a way to come back. So when I focus, so basically the second game, we focus on control and basically working through the middle. Like the one advantage to cast a queen side, sorry, to being down a queen is you can cast a queen side faster. So I'll cast a queen side. And now instead of trying to pawn storm and, and go for this crazy double edge attack, I tell them, all right, play through the middle control the board, dictate trades, take space. And pretty much every time, the second time, they end up like winning the game. Um, and I think that is a very important thing. Like if you try to knock them out or you don't do anything, like they're gonna come back. So you have to aggressively control the, the board and the position. Um, so that's what we do for winning positions. The other one I do is something called the turtle. Um, and I'm gonna make a YouTube video on this. Basically, it's an opening where I kind of just sit there and do nothing the whole time and wait for them and have them set up and do and, and move all their pieces um and basically it helps them plan how to break through how to have an attack and do all this good stuff um so that's the two for winning positions pawn weaknesses i went i had a whole week i think last week where i went through all the pawn weaknesses of my students the strategy against them um so examples are double pawn backwards pawn hook pawn over pushed pawn isolated pawn so basically the all these reads they kind of backwards but i think i said backwards um and basically anytime they see these they can make this read all right we've gone over this this is the strategy this is what i gotta do and boom now i know what to do so um that's a, another big one for uh, uh middle game now for end game improvement so two things that i've kind of been doing this week are um just essential end games that you need to know philidor position lucina position um I mean, I guess like obstacle of bishops, all this kind of stuff. Um, so that I've been going through them, you know, like, all right, if you get this, you know what to do, and it, it helps build technique. Um, and then the other one that I've kind of started doing this week is I will play them rook and eight pawns versus rook and eight pawns. Um, 
and it's kind of the same thing. First game, kind of let them just do what they would normally do. <laughs> Generally, doesn't end up super well for them. Um, and then second game, I'm like, all right, let's, let me try to help you. Let me walk you through what, what really you should be doing. What's the proper thing? And um, then they do much better. Um, so just like with my teacher, like we always do things twice. First one, I'm kind of on my own. Second one, it's with some, with some, basically I learned from the first one and some assistance so that the lesson's sinking better um, and we're making progress. So that has been kind of the end game improvement that I've really been working on with my students. Um, and now the last thing that um, I'm gonna talk about for my students that I think uh, is, this is probably more of a, uh, an area for imp improvement for me is to be not organized with, all right, what's the date, what do we cover, and all this stuff, or to write everything down. Um, it is really, what do we cover today, and what is the plan here? So basically, um, I need to have like, uh, all right, week one, this, week two, this. Um, right now, it's just like, I know all these things that these guys have to go through, and I'm just kind of doing it without like, a, I would say like a 10 to 15 week plan. It's more like, all right, this is what you need to cover. We're going to cover this, this, and this. Um, but it's more in my head than a written down kind of agenda. And that's what I think that I really want to improve on. Because I will notice like sometimes I'll be like, wait, have we covered this? And with some students it's yes, and with some students it's no. Um, so I really think if I can plan ahead, I'll already know like, all right, this is your checklist, this is what we gotta go over. And this is the timeline that we're gonna be looking to do this. So um, that's uh, pretty much it for the students once again. Everyone's doing pretty well. I mean, some of the people are doing extraordinarily well. Um, but room for improvement and room for getting better at chess is really kind of this, uh, this second wave that uh, I've been going for. And it's interesting because it really parallels my chess journey too. Like, <laughs> I was very big on openings, got my students good on openings. Now we're really working on middle game and end game. My students are getting better at middle game and end game. And, um, I mean, really, like, as I progress and make GM this summer, it, I think uh, the students are going to really kind of benefit the same thing. And I will really tie this in um, at the end of the podcast with kind of the things I've learned in life the last couple of weeks. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's it for my students. And next I'm going to go just some, some, some random stuff, a lot of sports and uh, TV shows and stuff that I've been learning in life. All right, so lastly, I'm just going to talk about some things going on in life, some observations, a lot of sports and TV shows like I talked about. Um, NBA regular season is over. I'm really excited for this playoffs. Um, I think it's going to be a very chaotic playoff. I think a lot of teams, okay, I mean, the best way to put it is I don't think there's really a dominant favorite that you're like, okay, this team is definitely going to win. I think there's a lot of teams that you think are going to win the first round matchup, like the Thunder, the Nuggets. I mean, even the, all these guys, they're going to play good teams. Like, I mean, after the game that I just watched, I think the Warriors are out. <laughs> the Kings are going to be the eighth seed. Or no. So how does it work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Lakers are going to play the Nuggets. And the Kings are going to play... I don't even know. But basically, Kings, Lakers probably are the 7-8 seed, I think. And... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are someone's out? Yeah, yeah, the loser of this game is just out. Wow, no way. So the late, the Warriors are, okay, sorry. I'm having this huge epiphany um, while doing this, but I think the way that it works is six, no, seven and eight played, and the loser plays the winner of nine, 10. So seven and eight were the Lakers and the Pelicans. So essentially the Lakers won so they're going to play the two seed, which are the Nuggets, which honestly, Nuggets, big favorites, but I wouldn't say it's impossible for the Lakers to win. And now the Kings are going to play the, the, the Pelicans because the Pelicans lost to the Lakers. And the uh, basically, it's going to be Pelicans or Kings to get that eight seed to play the Thunder. And I mean, I would say probably the... I, mean, I don't even know, man. Pelicans, Kings, it's going to be... Any, any any team could win. I mean, Zion might be hurt. If Zion's hurt, then 100%. Um, it's going to be Kings versus Thunder. That one, I, I, that one I, I'm pretty confident that the, the Thunder are going to win. But like I said, even the 1 and 8 seeds are close matchups. Like in the East, it's a whole other thing. 
basically, I think the Sixers and the Heat are going to be 7-8. and eight. Now, it's possible that the Bulls or the Hawks beat the Sixers or Heat to take their spot. If that is the case, well, one thing that's interesting is if the Hawks play the Celt- Celtics, that was going to be an interesting series because the, the Hawks somehow had the Celtics number. No one else number they had, but they found a way to have the Celtics number. Um, but apart from that, like once again, Celtics versus Heat, Celtics versus Sixers, close series. Um, I think the Knicks are the two seed. The Knicks are good, but if they play the Celtics or the Heat or the the the, the Sixers or the Heat, close series. The only team I'm really trying to fade that I think is kind of kind of frauds are the Cavs. The Bucks could be good or they could be really bad. But apart from that, literally any team could be anyone. Um, I think the Mavs, I would put them as big favorites against the Clippers. But, um, yeah, and then once it goes past the first round of playoffs, I mean, it's basically heavyweights every round. Like, anyone can be anyone. It's really going to come down to who's playing better, who's got the better matchups. I mean, who's locked in and dialed in. I mean, that's, that's basically what it's going to come down to. So it's going to be really interesting. I'm going to have a lot of fun watching it. The regular season was a lot of fun. Definitely, so I definitely bet on games over the the season and i definitely learned a lot of things i would say as in like what to avoid what's good so i'm i'm, I'm already excited for next season it's gonna be in october which is gonna be a million years from now but when it is um definitely looking to to get back in there i would say i made a decent amount um betting on the nba this season um definitely some tough days for sure but the bit basically the good days were so good that they made up for months basically and i and i basically had enough good days uh, this year to, to to say it was a pretty good season. Um, now UFC 300 was another big event that took place um, this past weekend. Um, overall, I would say the card was pretty good. Um, some fights delivered, some fights did not deliver. Definitely made some really dumb decisions, less bets. Um, that looking back, you're just like, what are you doing? It's it's like that's the one thing with betting or analyzing sports. Like, you can't get emotionally invested or you can't, like, bet with your heart. You got to think, all right, practically, what is going to happen here? Most likely, what is going to happen here? And, of course, there's a lot of analytics and stuff to go behind that. And, I mean, sometimes you get what's not supposed to happen, but it happens. So, I mean, that's, I guess, what makes it fun and interesting. Um, But, anyway, UFC 300, the big, big events that I would say from UFC 300 were 100% Max Holloway knocking out. Um, Justin Gaethje with one second left. I actually had bet Holloway by KO. Honestly, looking back, terrible bet. But basically, what I what happened is what I thought would happen, and I, I really was close to going Holloway round five or four. Um, but Holloway don't get knocked out. He ha- he's honestly the best boxer in the UFC. Like, and Justin is not going to take him down. He's going to try to box him and Holloway's the longer fighter he's going to keep good range um and he's going to just keep hitting him round after round after round and honestly if they didn't they basically the the last 10 seconds Holloway pointed at the middle of the ring and was like all right let's go let's swing and he basically caught Justin with one second left um and he knocked him out and I had Holloway by TKO um if they don't do the meet in the middle, they probably both cruise to, to they get to a decision. Holloway wins probably forty five fifty or forty six forty nine. Um, but I mean, it is what it is. That's why the sport is fun. Really weird fight. Um, Wei Li Zhang versus Yan Zhao Nan. Basically, I think end of round two. Um, Wei Li had Yan in a rear naked choke for like thirty seconds, and they didn't call the fight. And basically, the round ended, and Jan basically couldn't. She couldn't walk. She was out. She was a hundred percent out. I think uh, one her corner was like, "Do you want me to wake her up?" Like that's how out she was. They were like, "Yo, do we need to wake this girl up?" I don't think she's okay. And um, <laughs> but she kept going, and then basically she almost got knocked out later on, but uh, she survived. And I mean, she had some moments too. Um, I mean, basically, Willie's was so gassed that she. I mean, she basically, so Wade Lee Zhang ended up winning by decision, but she won by submission and knockout in the same fight. Like, that's how much of a of an interesting fight it was. 
Um, Pereira versus Hill. I mean, that one was a lock of the night. I should have gone heavier on that, but Pereira. So basically, what Jamal is known for is okay. He's a really good striker. Has good power. Really good, smart striker. Cerebral is maybe a word that some people would use. Um, but one thing that he does is when he, I think when he throws, he leaves his hand down. And buddy, you cannot leave your hand down against Alex Pereira. He will find your chin. If he finds your chin, it's over. And he basically did that in the first round. <laughs> like two minutes in, one there was something cool. Like uh, Pereira got hit with a low blow. It wasn't like a terrible low blow. And then Herb comes in. Basically, the ref comes in to like, all right, it's a low blow, and he's just like, no, nah, I'm good. Uh, I gotta finish this guy. He basically just pushes the ref away, and he's like, stay out of this. And then he basically goes on to knock him out very very soon afterwards so um that was good the Oliver fight was depressing because Oliver kind of had his moments to almost submitted him a couple times um but sorry can survive and then you know, basically he and i okay i really this actually really bothers me like submission attempts should be somewhere close to a knockdown especially if they're really close i see this time and time again like a guy gets two or three submission or one or two submission attempts that are really close to getting finished, but they don't. And the other guy's on top, so he gets the credit for winning the round. And it's like, yo, like you almost lost. Like that should count towards the judges. I'm not saying it's like the same thing as a 10 8, but if you have a to submission attempt that's very close to, to finishing, um, the judges should count that as very serious. It's almost like a like a significant strike times a couple because like i mean <laughs> the fight was almost over like i think that counts for something right um but they don't really do that um and all, i mean basically what happened is surgeon was on top for more of the fight and uh they gave him the decision so tough for Oliveira. um yeah it is what it is um bow nickel look good i mean basically they're trying to hype this guy up. i mean he's good like 100 percent. he's good he's gonna be good so nothing to say there kind of did what he's supposed to do uh yuri knocked out rakich and i mean this was one of those where it's like duh this is gonna happen though apparently rakich was like, really putting it on in round one i only started watching round two because uh it was during the tournament but uh from what i saw yuri was a samurai and he i mean took him out um Aljamain sterling fought cater and I mean, Al Jermaine did exactly what I thought he was going to do. I thought he might actually get the finish. I know Cater is very tough. Um, he locked in, like, some Anaconda choke, too. So, I mean, I guess Cater knows what he's doing on the ground, but he just didn't have what it, what it, what it takes on the feet, and uh, Al Jermaine just was able to kind of have his way. Kayla Harrison did what she's supposed to do. Kind of also had it coming. Diego Lopez, honestly, I should have gone harder on this. <sighs> Maybe it, instead of trying to bet every single fight, the ones that you really know... That's what you gotta do. Just hit it hard. I mean, I think that makes duh a lot of sense. Um, Turner versus Moicano. That was a good fight. Basically, Moicano got knocked out, but Jalen didn't try to knock him out after he's knocked out. Moicano got up, took him down, and this is the whole kind of thing in the fight. If Moicano takes him down, he can finish him. Unfortunately, I had him by submission, and basically T Turner just got full mounted, beat down, ref stopped the fight. And uh, it is what it is. And then the other three fights were all kind of depressing. I actually started out the card 0 for 3. Um, I guess it is what it is. So, um, honestly, very good card. The Max Holloway moment might be top five UFC moments ever. Um, so that's really cool um, and fun to, uh, fun to watch. One thing that was really hard is it, during tournaments, it's very hard to coordinate and figure out what you're doing after the tournament. And, like... People want to meet up, but people also don't want to meet up. Or people want to meet up, but then they're one person's over here, one person's over there, one person's over here, and it's like they don't all want to come to the same place. And it's like, man, I'm tired of doing these logistics. I am already doing logistics for the tournament, and now I got to do logistics for Saturday night, on top of some other logistics where someone else needed a favor from me. And it's just annoying, man. It's it's honestly just annoying. Like this is why I think planning is very important. This might be why I think a lot of girls are like, we need to have, we need to plan, we need to figure this out. Because if we don't, now it's just this chaos gray zone. Like I don't know what is happening. You don't know what's happening, and and uh, we're just stuck in this. And uh, it's it's honestly very very annoying, and uh, definitely something that uh, 
needs to be, or I understand the importance now, because if you don't plan, now you're stuck and being stuck sucks. Um, so that's pretty much it for NBA and UFC. Now, one show that I finished over the last week, week and a half, was a show called Spartacus. Super cool show, very fun show. <clears throat> Basically a show made for guys, <laughs> is the best way to put it. Um, it's like a 300 UFC and uh, 300 UFC and uh, things uh, rated R were all put together. Um, but a lot of good morals too, like the, the, or good lessons to learn. Like basically, it's and honestly, it's based off a true story, which I kind of learned at the end, which is honestly so insane and really cool in my opinion. Like basically, this guy is in the Roman army. Um, in real life, I'm not sure why they make him a gladiator, but in the show, basically, he quote unquote disobeys orders, but the orders given were incorrect orders or like really bad orders, so that's why he um. That's why he, quote unquote, disobeyed him, and then he got basically made a gladiator, fought his way out, started a rebellion, um, ended up really beating some very high level generals or winning some really high level battles in uh, the Roman War, and eventually, well, I don't want to ruin it for you guys, but kind of the lesson that you really want to learn, uh, that the one one of the big ones that I learned is um, when you mistreat people. When you um, almost bully people, when you uh, belittle people, which happened a lot with like the Romans and the gladiators, or the Romans and the, the slave workers that they had, like those people will remember. Like they might not, they might, they might act nice. They might be like, "Oh yeah, cool, whatever," but they remember. And your time is going to come. Is kind of the way. I would I would put it like when 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 the tables turn and um, they have the upper hand like they don't forget those kind of things and I think that's why it's very important to treat people good um, just do your best but um, on the flip side like some people be asking for it like some people just want to fight like I think that's another thing that you got to realize in life like there are people out there who literally just they want to fight like that's what they want to do that's uh, they're, I mean, I guess they're unhappy with themselves or unhappy with something, with someone, um, and they want to fight. So um, that um, is one of the things that I really wanted to, to tie in is, is reading people and, and knowing the patterns that kind of come up. Like, now that I'm almost 30, I can't believe I'm saying this now, but um, you kind of have these patterns of like, okay, I've seen this person before. Or it's, not, I mean, I'm not saying I've literally seen this person before, but the way you act is almost the same as someone I know and the way they acted. And pretty much whatever they do, you're doing the same things. And pretty much whatever I do, you're going to react the same way. And I'm not going to I'm not trying to say that like all people are the same or like you can 100% know that just because one person did something the other person's going to do something, but low key like there's a very high probability. And something with like betting on sports, playing chess, like at some point you start playing numbers or you start understanding numbers and probability and you're just like, I know where this is going. I know what's going to happen next. And um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, this kind of, th I'm not saying that life is a video game. I'm not saying that um, that life is a simulation, but this kind of gives credence to the idea that life is a, like, it's some something's going on here. And of course, this is where you could, we're, I would tie it into God or where a lot of other people tie into God, but it's just like, and maybe I've said this in another podcast, but life is a flat circle is a really common idea in this TV show called, um, true detective where it's like, until things really change, you're going to find yourself in this circle, this basically the circular pattern of this happens, then this happens and this happens. And then you start over and then this happens and this happens and this happens. And Maybe it is a circle that happens one, every, one like one time it happens one to three weeks, one time it happens one to two months, but you you basically you see like this is a circular pattern that I just keep seeing in my life, and like a lot of people like what they want to do is they want to break this pattern. They don't want to be stuck in this pattern. I mean, you could even say this for chess players in rating. Like I've been at this rating forever. Like I keep doing this. Like why is my rating like this? 
Like, and that's when you got to realize you need to break the circle. You need to do something that changes the outcome. Um, if you don't, like, why do you expect things to change? Like, that's, I think, a very normal uh, response to a circular pattern. If you don't change anything, well, welcome back. That's a circle. You keep walking around the circle, you're going to be where you were before. Um, and, yeah, I mean, it, it can be frustrating. It can be weird. And, like I said, the same way it affects people relationships all these kind of things um you start learning as as you get older like all right i've been here before i've met like okay let me give you an example um i've actually basically i've dated the same girl twice like i'm not saying i've <laughs> i mean that i've done too i've dated, dated some girls multiple times four or five times between breakups but what i really meant was like there's these two girls and they almost acted the same exact way. They would always, I don't know how much I want to get into specifics, but they were very like, you know, go get them type A personalities. Um, but really what they really were was they were very, I would say, soft on the inside. <laughs> That's such a terrible way to put it. But they, I mean, basically they were, they were sensitive is the way to put it. Um, I'm pretty much all girls are sensitive in a sense. But I basically saw this pattern of like this, this, and this. And now this other person is acting this, this, and this way. And when we fight, it's this, this, and this. When we're happy, it's this, this, and this. So there's these two girls I dated. And now there's this third girl that I met. And I mean, she's literally the same exact. I'm not going to say the same exact. They have their different things. All the, these girls also, they talk so much. They want to talk on the phone. They want to. They And they love to talk in circles where it's like. You tell them the same thing again and again, and they keep bringing the same thing again and again. And as I get older, I'm like, I don't have time for this. I don't want to go on a search. I have work to do. I have a business to run. Like, we can't just keep having the same conversation. This is annoying. Um, and, yeah, basically with this third girl, I can almost see what's going to happen before it happened. It's like telling the future. Maybe this is what, like, mind readers do, or not mind readers, but people, fortune tellers. They can kind of just look at you and know, all right, well, this is probably what's going to happen. Maybe they're old enough or they're... They've seen enough where they just know, all right, well, I've seen this kind of, this book before, and I know kind of how the story ends. I mean, we definitely see that with movies, too. Like, movies definitely follow a formula. You know pretty much what's going to happen next. Um, character almost dies, but he survives. He becomes stronger, and boom, now he's a hero. Like, the hero's journey is a circle. Everything's a circle. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm going really deep on the psychology level here. I honestly wanted, I was thinking this is going to be the shortest section of the podcast. But it's uh, it's blossom or it's turned into it's turned into quite the circle. It's the best way to put it. Um, if if this wasn't called EACC nine, a hundred percent, I'd call it circles. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess another thing I see with students, the students who practice circle, students who don't practice circle, um, and then people want to improve, they get better. It's like everything's like circles, it's patterns, NPCs. Like this is the stuff that uh, I've definitely just been seeing and and as you get older i mean hopefully you start recognizing it and you, you learn from it and that's kind of the phase i'm in i'm in the recognizing phase where it's and it, it's with myself too 100 percent. like i said with, with chess with rating with relationships with family with everything and um uh, basically uh you gotta learn and uh you gotta fix some fix things otherwise the circle continues is the best way to put it so yeah that's it's a big big thing into um the circles um now two more okay real quick two tv shows i'm gonna be really quick about this um invincible ended i think last week great great show like honestly the last episode of season two might have been the greatest tv episode of anything i've seen so far like i'm sure there's some other episode other tv shows and stuff up there but invincible season two last episode if I would show anyone one episode of anything, it would be that episode. It was visceral. It was emo it had good emotions. It had good action. Psychology was really imp interesting there. Like you see a character get broken, you see a character grow, and you understand. Like of course, it helps if you watch the whole show. But even if you just saw that episode, it would blow your mind. Is what I um of opinion of. And then, Shogun, um, is a show that I'm watching about medieval Japan. Um, and uh, what I, I mean, there's a lot of things I find very interesting about it. I've always, 
I've always found Japanese culture interesting, at least. I'm not going to say, like, I've wanted to move to Japan and do this. I actually kind of have wanted to, at some point, live in Japan and become a samurai, but that's not quite the, quite the thing that you can just do, you know. Um, but that's ne- neither here nor there. Um, but what's very interesting about this show is the politics that go on with governments and the conspiracies and maneuvering. And I mean, I guess maybe with running this business and all this kind of stuff, though, we were very far away from anything political happening. Um, I find it very interesting. Um, and then this is the last thing I'm going to say. Okay, fine, two things. Just with the UFC 300, um, definitely a big part of it, of every UFC, especially pay per views, is I get to watch Dana White talk after the, about do the post fight conference. Always learn a lot from that. Um, I think for anyone who's trying to aspire to build a business, um, I'm not going to say do everything he does because definitely some things probably you don't want to do. Or it's like, I mean, I guess when you work in, when you own a business, when you run a business, you're going to have to have some tough conversations and, and do some, um, make some tough decisions. Um, but I definitely learn a lot from that. And one thing I can definitely say that I've taken away, not just in business or life, is when people try to attack Dana. Or when they try to, <clears throat> I'm going to say, maybe annoy him or ask this question they know is going to be a question that's going to make him annoyed or make him angry. or I mean, you, you kind of get it. You know when people ask you a question that they're basically they're trying to piss you off is the easiest way to put it. Um, when they do that, he doesn't just, he never, he never addresses it passively. He's never like, oh, yeah, whatever, you know, come on, whatever. I mean, speaking of circles, that's a whole other archetype that I've, I've, I've really had. Definitely had friends who were just like the whatever dudes who were just like, yeah, dude, I'll just do whatever. Um, I'm cool with that. I'm done with that. And at some point, you're just like, what do you want to do? Like, I can't, I mean, do you really want to do this? Like, I don't know if you want to do this because you say whatever, man, to everything. You're always like, yeah, dude, I'm down, whatever. And uh, <clears throat> I mean, I'm sure that drives some girls crazy, like. No, you have to know what you want. Like, do something, you know? Um, but, um, yeah, when Dana, when they attack him, when they try to make him annoyed, yeah, I mean, he coming at you back. He's swinging back. And that's definitely something that I've seen with uh, probably my personal life and with uh, just, I mean, even business, too. If you attack me, like, I mean, I'm a swing back. I mean, I'm an attacking type of play- chess player. I'm an attacking type of person, like, I'm not going to just play passive defense. I'm going like, to you just tee off on me. Like, we go to war, we go to war. And, I mean, you, you choose your fights, but if it's time to throw, it's time to throw. It's the best way to put it. And this is the last thing that I have to say that I'm out of here is strengths can become weaknesses, especially when the new shine wears off. Um, and what I mean here is, and the best example I'm going to put is with a lot of TV shows, the first season the first two seasons you're like yo this is the coolest part of the show and then i guarantee you by the last season or the last two seasons you're just like man are they gonna like do they have to do this again and again and again like i'm tired of it and a couple examples i'm going to give you walking dead first two see first i don't know honestly first season of walking dead like oh dude zombies zombies are so cool like or they're so interesting or they're so scary um and then you basically you get numb to seeing zombies all the time you're just like all right whatever it's a zombie you know like i've seen this before okay zombie almost got the guy whoop de doo um and then it doesn't get the guy and then uh, every once in a while zombies do get the guy and then the guy dies and then there's a new guy like you once again you see this circle so with spartacus like it's only three seasons so it's not too long but the first time you see like the gladiators and the basically there's a bunch of like uh it's a bunch of girls without clothes in the show and the first couple of times you're like oh dude this is so cool this is like a cool show and then basically like by the end like the last season i'm like playing chess while watching or having the show on and i'm like oh man they're fighting again like here we go what's gonna happen um let me guess one guy beats eight guys almost gets hit but he's okay oh look side character about to die fighting three guys he's dead um, and I'm not saying this like, okay, like at the end, I didn't like the show. Honestly, third season of it was probably the best season, but there's something that's interesting is the things that you think that are really cool in the beginning can become the things at the end, or it can eventually become something where you're like, man, he's got to do that again. Like I keep seeing this. Is he going to do something else? 
Like, uh, and this is how I'll end it. There was uh, there was one character, this guy, I think, Crixus. Dude always wanted to go to the war, and he's always like, I want to die honorably. Like, this is how I want to live. Like, we should die in battle. We should die. We should, he always wanted to die, and he always wanted to kill people. And at some point, you're like, bro, like, you shouldn't die. Like, you have, you have an army. You have people under you. Like, you can't just lead them to death. Like, you can't just die. And character ended up, like... Okay, um, I guess I'm spoiling it, but basically the guy ended up dying in battle, um, and it was very avoidable, and you were just like, the beginning you're like, you like this, like, the super cool macho dude who's always trying to go to battle and, you know, be a hero, and then at the end you're like, well, you ended up dead because of it, like, was it really worth it? Um, so that's kind of how I want to end this, it's just like, patterns, I'm starting to see patterns in life and people and business and chess, and... And okay, best way to tie it in, kept flagging winning positions, wasn't working. What did I do? Switch to 3-2. Now, have I won every single game? No. Am I going to lose games? Yes. But this is a change that is good. This will make me better. These are the things that you need to do if you want to get better at things. Make those necessary changes that will benefit you. Don't just keep doing the same thing. Because if you do, you get the same results, boom life becomes a circle all right so that's it for episode 49 episode 50 will be the next one it'd be cool doing my 50th episode we'll definitely have a lot to talk about so if you all made it this far you're doing the lord's work kudos to you thank you and i will talk to you guys later